You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling Podcast. Today I'm going to be talking with Ian. Ian's been on the show once before, over a year ago. We're going to talk about what's changed in sales over this time period, what's working for him and his team, and uh, how he's gone through this transition from... He was mostly a social seller type guy. Back when we were talking to him, he really found that to be powerful. But now as a leader in the telecom space, he's, he's kind of adapted it to his market. We're going to be talking about that. And, you know, how do you go through that transition? But before we get into the interview, I want to make sure you're checking out the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Got a lot of great sales topics. One's on sales assessments. You got to be able to be aware of these assessment tools that are out there and what the market is looking for. And this week I talked to a, a PhD and we talk about the top three things that he says can't change in people or don't change in people after like the early 20s. Now, you know, there's science and there's, there's people, right? So you got to, got to be aware of these because as you change jobs, this is what people are going to be using these more and more and relying less and less on the handshake. Also, I'm going to be doing some episodes on Gong's content. They did a great post on closing. I'm going to do something on the Sales Questions podcast. Make sure you're checking that out. Also, wait to the end when I sum everything up with my conversation about Ian and give you an update on what's going on here at The Brutal Truth and on the training front. We're coming into the summer, the last month of Q2. Ah... The year's going to be half over before you know it. Then we're going to go into the July and August, and those are the months that you really have to utilize the the slow times. You know, you know, take a take a little vacation, but you also have to hone in your skills for the rest of the year because look, it's all set up against us now. Only fifty three percent of us are making quota, so make sure you're checking that out. Also, make sure you're checking out Nudge.ai. They've got it all automated as far as account-based selling. They've got it all systemized. It, and I've got a course on that that's free with the coupon Nudge. So just go to B2Brevenue.com, hit training, and then pick out the Nudge course. Hey, Ian, welcome back to the show. Uh, as a way of getting started, give us a little bit of an update on yourself. Brian, great to speak to you again and your audience. Um, yeah, so uh, since we last spoke, uh, I've been busy uh, working on the sales cadence at the business I joined a year ago and going through all those things that we all go through uh, in uh, trying to drive sales teams. But the real thing, and I guess we're going to have a chat about some of those things, is lots of things changing, as always, and lots of them are changing very quickly that impact on challenges to overcome and opportunities to grab hold of. Excellent. I mean, things have really changed a lot. I mean, especially you last time we spoke, you were super into social. You mm-hmm. were having a lot of success with it. Yeah. Um, what made you change course or did you see a brighter well, opportunity or? Well, well, no, well, no it's, it's, the, the social selling piece is, is still there. And actually, I think that's going to become even more important based on some of the things that are happening. So and you can pick into these as you will. So some some of the big things that are happening are GDPR, which is, is a big European data law that goes live next week, the 25th of May, uh, as we speak today, uh, or gets enforced at that point. And that, that's impacting how people use data. Uh, the right of consent. Are you allowed to even call anyone and this sort of thing? Um, so that's going to push people, I think, you, to using social because it does get you around some of those things. Um, I'm seeing a big push, and I've been a big push back to pick up the phone. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> just pick up the phone because I think one of the observations I've had, and I'm always self critiquing and looking at teams, is people are getting drawn into the electronic medium, social yeah. selling, being one of them, email. And uh, and I, when I inherit what I inherited, and I, I've been working. There's a lot of young teams, and have you spoken to the customer? Sure. And then you check. Have you spoken? No, they haven't spoken to them. They've emailed back and forth, but they've phrased it as spoken to. Well, then that, that that those back and forth emails aren't a conversation, right? right? They're they're very formulaic. You're not getting tonality, which which gives a good piece of communication. You're not getting the the instant reaction where the customer may say something and you can hear something and say, what, oh, why do, you, why do you feel that way? What you're getting is a very prescriptive response or thought. That, or it, or, so, so that's a biggie that I'm seeing and, pu- and pushing on. Um, and the other big thing, I, I guess, is, per- and I emphasized last time, is personal bio, how you're viewed. Um, 
uh, before someone actually meets you is going to get critically more important. Microsoft announced, you may have seen in the last couple of months, and there's been a lot of uh, press talk and uh, explanation around what they're doing with Office 365 and LinkedIn, which they paid a fortune for embedding Office 365 data and profiles straight into the profile card in in 365. So that what that means is you'll look at an email or you'll look at the person's contact card in your um, Outlook and it's going to pull data in and flesh it out from LinkedIn, including their picture. Yeah, that's probably great if, if, if you're using that. Um, what, what struck me when you, you brought up the phone, because, uh, mm. you know, the phone has always been and certainly has been for the last, I'd say, five years, this uh, basketball that people are uh, yeah. <laughs> the social and people argue over. Yeah. And I really haven't had a dog in the fight. I kind of always say, you know, use what works. And yeah, I, I agree. And then I, I say, like, because I use the phone, you know, but yep. I use it differently than I think most people. I don't uh, call unscheduled people. I text a lot. I, yep. I, I'm on a lot of scheduled calls. How do you recommend your team using it? So, so yeah, and, that, and that's the interesting thing. What I, what I observe, and I get the uh, fortunate opportunity to engage with a lot of customers in contact and call center businesses and in sales for the tool that we use at Natterbox, which we, we sell on a nice uh, telephony integrated with Salesforce tool, et cetera. Um, so in those discussions, it's interesting seeing, seeing the different views out there. So I'm seeing still very some very old school approaches, which is bash the phone, number of calls a day, just, just get through them and play the numbers game. And cold calling is becoming incredibly difficult. Right? And I talk to those agents and it is, it, 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 it's a horrible piece to go through. Because how many connections do you get? And depending on what business you're in, what vertical, yeah. whether it's consumer or business. But it's hard because we all do it. We all micro check the phone when the, when the call comes in. Is it a number that I know? Is it one? And you're making that, uh, now I can leave it. I'll let it get a voicemail and then I'll screen it. Yeah. And we all do it individ- as individuals. Um. But, but the problem with, that I've observed with this is people are still judging on the old metrics as well. So number of calls, number of connect, and, and without t- taking some more insight into that. Now, what I mean by that is where we integrate into people's CRMs, one of the things we talk to them about is that's great. We can give you all those telephony metrics. That, that's Take that as red. We can give you all those wondrous things, how long the average call was, how many calls were transferred, how many bounced uh, one person to the next, how many dropped and you didn't call, they didn't get through, how many left your call queue and all that stuff. But where your agents are talking to someone, or you're particularly with salespeople, you may get those metrics and say, well, great, that Dave did 63 calls last week, and he was on this call time, an average call time, Sue did this much, etc. But what you're missing is who were they talking to? And that can be not just the organization, but also who. Yeah. Because that's the real insight. Because if I see someone, okay, he did loads of activity, is it the right activity? Did you do loads of calls to all your low-level, low-cost prospects because you get through to them easier as opposed to your top three prospects, which are more challenging, but they're 80% of your pipe value, and that's what means something to the business. You called them last week, you connected, but those ones you spent, actually, your average talk time to that one was three minutes, that was six. That wasn't a meaningful development and progression of your call, but you, what you've done in typically in your CRM is said, called them, and this is what an action, and you make notes, and as a sales leader looking at that and analyzing it, a, it's difficult to, to see the wood for the trees because there's often a lot of data. You want to pull out the exceptions or look at the, the, those key things. But then when you do, what do I know? I know what the salesperson's told me. I've got no other metrics linked to it automatically that say that call was only two minutes. That, they, they say they had loads of conversations last week. They only spoke to them in total for 23 minutes to that business and to the key decision maker because you can track the numbers, right? If someone's called their DDI or their mobile, we can track to an individual. So it's it, it, it's really going that one step further and taking um, data, turning it into information, and then from that information, gaining meaningful insight onto really what is going on and really what coaching do people need or what direction do they need from sales leadership of. You're not placing your bet and putting your activity into the right place to get the great return. You are busy. You're trying but you're not going to produce the results. And that and that's the bit that I think is changing. People need to get smarter in sales. That's the big difference. It's been talked around for a long time. And I think it's um, both on the sales rep side and on the manager, even more on the manager leadership side. Mm. 
I, I started a course in January called uh, Starting the Conversation, Getting the Meeting. And mm -hmm. one of the key elements of it is uh, on the cold, with you know, where there's not inbound, it's cold outbound. They don't know you, yeah. you don't know them, that you have to take your time. You have to go through these methodical steps, and there has to be a time gap in between the steps. And their managers are telling them to do just the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good point. You know, I do. Have you got those patterns? Even you're absolutely right of what's going on, and to context that with the social bit you mentioned, I, here's what I see is going oh, on. Yeah. You need to. There's a book by Joanne Black called No More Cold Calling, and people look at that and say, "Oh, great, we we just don't have to do calling." No, that's not what it's about. It's about their calls aren't cold. So it's about using social to get some engagement, insight, do what I call the Sherlock I spoke about last time, research. Get yourself into a position where the call is no longer cold, but as soon as you can get there, get to the phone. Get a real call. So I've presented a number of events um, since we spoke, and I always ask the audience now a little a trick out I use, which is pretty fundamental when I know where I'm taking this, is how many of you believe – if you've got a prospect, we're not where it's a transactional thing over the web, but a real business to business, you've got a good value deal going on, it would be better to meet in person. We're here today seeing each other in person. There is more value in that than um, doing it electronic. Yeah, absolutely. That would be my preferred engagement. You get more. You can see what's going on with the customer's eye. You know, it's the old adage of seeing, seeing the whites of their eyes. But you can see their smile. If there's people in the room and multiple of them, you can see them talk to each other and what, oh, well, there was something there you reacted to I was showing or this sort of thing. So that would be your preference. <clears throat> so, if that, <clears throat> so if that's your preference, logic would say your second step down would be you'd speak to them and at least have the voice. The yeah, absolutely. So and that's why I lead into why oh why is the volume of stuff and not just discussions, but negotiations going on on email. Right. Yeah, and and everybody's it's trying to things. put the whole conversation in email, one email. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 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 it's and what I've said is it's that balance, guys. In particular, I've seen this millennials because it's all electronic, it's all WhatsApp and Snapchat. Is in sales, it's about now the world we're in now. I believe is use social selling and all that stuff to get you to the table. You have to get to the table differently than you did before. Yeah. If you can pick up the phone and get straight through and shortcut, absolutely do it. But it, but it's that's not the norm. So you need to get to the table. Get to the table, have the conversation, at least get on the phone. Um, still use email for for where it's appropriate, right? Sharing it. I'll send you a confirmation of the bullets we just discussed. Um, it's, it is a useful medium, absolutely. I don't negate that. And you save the leaving voicemail back and forth. But where something in those discussions then needs inflection or I want to gauge their reaction to something. Don't just send them the pricing proposal and then phone them. They've read it. They've had their reaction. Set, talk to them through it first. Let them call them. Yeah. Talk them through it. Hear their reaction. Well, let me just send you something while I'm on the line. Well, let me share my screen. Yeah. Do you see this? And yeah. hear what they're saying. Oh, oh okay. Well, there was obviously something there you didn't expect. You can't do that if you send them an email and they lock them. How many people, salespeople have had the, I can't get hold of them. I've sent them some stuff they asked for, and now I can't get hold of them. Right. Why? You don't know. <laughs> and are you ever going to find out? That's the problem. Yeah, You're using it. the wrong medium for the wrong information. At the wrong. It's a blend. You've got to learn to blend this stuff. So I think social is at the beginning and, and then blends into email or in mails from LinkedIn. That should then go away and become a blend of talking, meeting, and email using the appropriate communication method for that. And sometimes it's hard to get someone on the phone. I get that. Maybe use email to schedule the call. Great. But don't because you can't get them on the phone, then back off. Oh, I'll just send them anyway then. That's it, because I, I think it is powerful. And, you know, probably when I started the podcast seriously about, you know, three, four years ago, I went to mm -hmm. one of those schedule links and, yep. you know, I'd always give people the option of texting me to pick a time or and and the boomers just want to jump on the phone. So yep. it, it is kind of a generational thing. And when you see millennials, they don't talk on the phone. And then you go to yeah. Gen Z, they definitely, I don't know if they know there's a phone. You can actually use it to talk. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
So maybe and, talking on the yeah. phone or not talking in person is a skill that has to be kind of developed. I, I think it's going to be a, a person. I just think, and not because I'm a rever- averse to change anyway. I wouldn't have taken on social selling, but I just think that's a difficult one. How can you get inflection yeah. and reaction unless you're live chat, but it's, you know, I'd still argue with that. You're not getting that inflection. You know, if someone's angry, are they putting it in capitals to tell you, you know, or how do you shout through the keyboard? There's little ways you can hear it, but you can't see if they're uh, hitting the keys harder. Um, whereas if I'm talking to you and, and Brian, I'm, I'm not sure I understood that just the tonality of voice or the pace or, Oh, straight away. That tells you something we, 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 in, we, Take that in, and in a microsecond, make some into. Oh, what did you? Why did you pause then? Yeah, yeah, and 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 there are even some companies that don't have either the capability or the interest of actually meeting the customer. You know, and I was yeah. I was always an outside guy. You know, I, I did an inside role yeah. at the very beginning, long, long time yeah. ago, and I I could always tell. I always wanted to be in front of the customer. Because yeah. the quality was so, it was, you know, 10 to 100x more effective than the phone. Absolutely. Because the phone Absolutely. has a sense, uh, has a time sensitivity to it, right? Yeah, you know. but, it's, but, but, but phone's better than email. That's, that's, that's oh, what yeah. I'm saying. Here. But does. absolutely. And, and interesting you say about the meetings. I've see, seen a pattern, which is great when it's competitors, of people not visiting customers. So I, with my team, it's guys, if it's worth the, the visiting you know, and you take in, particularly in the U.S., the scale. I, I ran a sales team there for for three months building, and I learned a lot in the U.S. about the scale. <laughs> you, you can't just pop there. The U.K. can be difficult. You know, it can take five, six hours to get to the other end of the country, or but another scale. But where it's applicable, when it's a deal value of the right size. So we, 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 we've recently done an extremely large global customer partnership. And part of it was being global. Was the US. We came to the U.S. for the meeting. Yeah. It justified it, right? Yeah. Um, if it was five users, that reality, no, you can do it over the phone and the web, and usually the customer respects that and gets it. But I'm seeing competitors where my team have gone in and met a prospect um, to try and understand. Phone conversation first to qualify that we're not wasting each other's time, but actually it feels like there's flesh on the bone. We should, but can we come and meet you? And the interesting, the customer, oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. And then what we've got when we've built some warmth, as you describe in the room, because you're people and you know you get your coffee and have a chat and they might walk you around the office um we've had the really like you coming in the other the other providers um did it all over the phone did a web demo they've not even asked to come and see us yeah. straight away forget forget what we've got more rapport it doesn't mean they're going to buy you but <clears throat> people do buy from people and if it's a close run thing which often it is in uh, comparisons um the photo finish works right you only have to be a, a nose ahead and if that nose is I don't know why, but and I've had customers say, I don't know why, I just feel like I like you guys. I feel we could work together. And that's it. It is. And I, you know, I can t- can't tell you the number of times it's happened. I've, uh, one of my earlier jobs, uh, a sales rep just flew out to meet the guy and the guy bought the product, not because he wanted, he just felt bad that the, the guy went all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And my strategy in a lot of those beauty contest type deals was spend the most amount of time with the client. Yeah. Uh, and and let's face it, it's, that's part of the human interaction. And if you've ever dealt with a recruiter, um, mm-hmm. the recruiter who you know calls you the most, who helps you the most, who cares about you the most, gets the most amount of attention. And in B2C, yeah. that, that works, right? Yeah. You know, if you're buying a car, you know, the, and I've, I've bought a car where somebody just gave me the key and said, yep. there's the car over there. And it was, you know, a fob. It was like yep. the first year the fobs came out. And I go, what do I do with this? You know, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. But, that, but that's, a, that's a great example. I, you know, in your, in your area, realtors, but over here as, as state agencies. You know, that's I went through that a number of years ago when we bought a property, uh, a property, a different property moving, etc. And and it did flabbergast me. These are salespeople coming out, you know, with the keys, basically the key holders. We, no one went in the house with us. No one walked in and 
talk to us around here some of the features or you know that's particularly great if you want to do this because all the area great what you really like is it's only two minutes to the shops or it takes you eight minutes. nothing no selling at all yeah. leave you the keys wait outside when you come out what do you think oh sell yeah. yourself and Hang that, on a minute. This is this is an incredibly expensive buy. Don't tell me you're not getting commission on 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 this, um, but you don't care about it, right? All you're doing is playing the numbers game. And, it, and it's that's it. If you want to really learn, watch these um, uh, realtor videos on YouTube. Yeah. When, when you get a, a good realtor, I mean, they know yeah. what every material is, what kind of floor it is, yeah. the appliances. Uh, the type of glass, the the uh, ceiling height, uh, how it compares yeah. to the comparables, uh, what the average uh, return on investment there is, the school ratings. You know, it, it's all these little details instead of, right, here's the keys, figure it out for yourself. You know, and like I, I own a place and I go, I would literally mm. have to take an hour to teach the realtor the difference between my place and the the ones you know down the street yeah you yeah. know and exactly why it would be worth more and you know damn well they won't listen they'll they'll you know come they'll open the door have an open house and bake yeah. some cookies and not do it and i think in sales we're doing the same thing we're kind of showing up answering questions and assuming the buyer is on a journey and yeah i i don't think they are <laughs> you know i think they're no well here's a great one like fundamental selling my i believe is uh, the biggest bug i have is questioning because yeah. the more i i understand about how, um, what you're trying to do why and why and what you try what that outcome would be and how would that change you how would it change your business the more i can understand is that important and whether we've got that function feature, whatever, or is it, you just thought of it, well, what are the important things and how do I sell to you? How do I help you better, et cetera? You can't do that electronically. No. You, you know, that, that is engaging with people. Um, and you also, you're asking them to share a lot of information. What are you going to do? Email, and I've seen a cut by a by, I've seen a salesman do this in the past where it was, this is all the sort of questions we want to ask about how, what we need to know to understand which modules and whether we're a good fit and who our references we would use would be and examples. Are going to, and they emailed the list of questions, <laughs> the customer, and asked them, could you fill in these 30 questions or so, please? And, and, and as expected, you didn't get it back, right? And when I saw the email, uh, this was quite a few years ago, was, really? <laughs> you, you've got to earn the right. You've got to earn the respect. And some questions are more sensitive than others, and you have to phrase them as a soft question. You can't go head in with, you know, the old, well, what's your budget? It's, you know, uh, what, yeah. what, it, it's earn the right, bit of chat about things. Okay, so based on that, it's quite important. It's going to save you money. What, do you have a cost expectation for this project? Have you, has, have you had any thoughts about that? Different. How do you put that in email? How do you put your tone and adjust to the customer's tone you in email? You can't. And electronics. And, 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 and it's much better, like you said, eye to eye. You know, you can you can gauge if they're uncomfortable or they're busy. How do you know they're not on mute, playing playing solitaire or talking to their colleague? Right, like like you know, everyone. You know, some people still do webinars, and I'm like, okay, you know, th there's still some value there because there are people that do want to interact in a mm. group setting, but most people just watch the recording on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of on this rant about, you know, with all this change in sales, what about sales hasn't changed and will never change, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it, what will never change is there's still going to be a human being on the other end. Yeah. And, and they want to be treated like a human being. And if you want them to do something, they you have to build up a know, like, and trust relationship with them. Yeah. And, and if you don't have that, they're not going to trust you. And which, exactly. which means whatever you say isn't going to be taken as the truth. It's going to be gauged as just words, much yeah. like everybody else. So if you yeah. want to distinguish yourself, you have to give more. You have yeah. to do more. And, you know, with any product, you know, I, I just bought a, a new product last night. And it's just like, this should be a whole lot easier to use than it is. It's like... Yeah. And just the most basic, simple functionality didn't work in certain cases. And you're like, 
how, and this is from a big company. And you're like, how does this even uh -huh. get into production? You know, yeah. it, and you know, like we, you mentioned screen sharing, I like, yeah. I would leverage that as much as possible, especially when you're going through that demo phase, that acquaintance phase. Yeah. Yeah, and, sure. You know, yeah. that, that phase is that that's where it can go wrong. Well, the, well, the big, one of the big things that uh, I'm, I've been really, you know, customer experience is going to overtake price and product as the differentiator. And there's loads of all the analyst groups talking about the same in different words, their own words. Um, now, it doesn't mean product feature function, no. what it does for you, and the price becomes irrelevant. But it just means it's not going to be the differentiator because more and more we're seeing, if you, even if you look at things like um, – the uh, things like Alexa, there's, you know, there's all the competitors. There's similar products on the market. If you look at, I was just looking at um, some mesh networks, yeah. uh, Wi-Fi, etc. And I saw one on TV, the Google one. I was quite neat. Search for it. Oh, there's, oh, I didn't realize there was six or seven other. Oh, now you start looking at comparison. And they're all similar. They've all got little different price points. Some are more expensive. And you start weighing up. But overall, they're not that massively different. So what, what's the differentiator going to be? It's going to be the brand you trust or the experience you get. And that comes back into not just the business, but the salesperson. If I see two and you both look similar and I both think you could do the job, who do I most trust? Who do I most think is going to be there for me and I felt I got on with? And if I didn't really like you and the fact you felt a bit smarmy or you, you felt a bit slow or when you never got back to me or there wasn't warmth, it was all done electronically. And I like this other guy or gal and... You, you, it, and it may be a subliminal decision. It may not be something you know you put down on paper, and that's the reason. But you have to make a decision. You're going to go one way or the other. That could be what swayed it. It's that removal of friction. And if you look at yeah. like, um, I, I don't know what Amazon's like in the UK, but in the US, it is faster for me to buy something on Amazon than it is for me to to go and buy it at the store that I can walk to. It's, it, it's the same. We're, we're seeing the same market disruption you're probably seeing in bricks and mortar. Um, you know, to Toys R Us, obviously, uh, from your side, is, is, but it's taken out the UK companies as well. And they cited, I think it was, Am I think they cited Amazon directly as killing their business. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and, we've, and we've seen it in Blockbuster Video right around the globe, Netflix, etc. It's, you can disrupt Technology-wise, and or in the market, you can disrupt by coming into something where the customer experience is better. No one turned against Toys R Us or Blockbuster because they were, they were bad brands. Not at all. We went right. somewhere else because the customer experience was better. It was faster, quicker, slicker. It was better for me. I don't have to go out. Um, if I'm passing Toys R Us, yeah, you'll drop in. That's great. But if I'm not and I want something, I'm going to plan to go there, park, and and – in seconds on your mobile, any device, anywhere, anytime, click, done, one click, and, and it's there they've the made morning. it easier. Yeah. And that's what we need to do as salespeople, I think, is make the customer experience to buy fit the market we're in. And that doesn't mean do it all electronically unless you're in a market where, you know, some products it works for, like for Amazon, they've engineered it, and it's a consumable product. If you're buying something more expensive or a business system, um, I don't think you go on a website and just order your new uh, learning management system or your new, certainly what we do, telephony system or CRM. It doesn't work that way. You want to make, you, you're going to look at the business and the processes and weigh up who you're going to deal with because it's going to be a long term relationship and we need support and all, all these metrics. Um, right. And, and you, know, you need people for that. You need people for that. And, you, and the people on the sales side need to understand it's your job to guide that person through that process like like that realtor should have opened that door for you explained yep. the carpet explained the year it was built explained how close it is to the schools to shopping uh you know who's the cable providers who's the you know electricity and utilities providers yeah yeah. You know, uh, how many square feet is it how tall the ceilings are when was it last painted all of those things, that journey through that house is an analogy of the journey that we're taking our customers through. It may be a six month, nine month journey, but if, yeah. if, if we're sitting outside in the, in our car playing with our phone, you know, waiting for them to decide, <laughs> and then we call it no decision. No, this is called no sales yeah. 
process. Well, well, that's a, that's a, do you know what? That's a really good analogy because you think about what you're describing there with the realtor approach is you're outside. You don't know no. what questions are coming up. And, and then inside they might have got a first impression, I like it. And then they see something and between, let's say, the husband and wife, not sure about this cupboard here. Now, if you were in there, you might be have, have some other answer to, oh, okay, is that a concern of yours? Does that outweigh the fact that you've got this beautiful southern facing garden? And actually, what's really great is that it's this, this, that objection that's now going to fester in their mind may have actually now just been swathed out of them. And actually, in the context, you're right. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. But if you're not there, they're not going to get the I hadn't thought of it that way unless they figure it out themselves. No, they're going to. Yeah. The right. and, and I think that's the same with what, what we're talking about is is you've got to blend all the mediums. We, it, sales is more complex than before. I remember the day when it was, you'd use the phone to get an appointment and you'd go and see them. Yep. And they'd ask you about your company and what do you do and et cetera. Now they've done all that research. What you, so the engagement you get is different. It's more informed for, and it should be from both sides, not just the customer's buying side. And you need to blend and use as and where appropriate, depending on your business and the social, email, phone, in-person, webinar, and blend all these tools at the right time, right place, with the right interaction. To, to and, and I think that's the real skill of the good salesperson today is know when and what to use. So absolutely, email's fine for this, but this bit, I must get them on the phone, engage the reaction first. And this bit, actually, I should probably sit in front of them. If they're going to spend £300,000 with me, a million pounds, whatever, I don't really want to send the pricing on email and wait for a phone call. I should probably go and see them about that one. Yes present it and it and it's figuring out what's right and appropriate for the right time for the right customer and the right transaction and i think people are getting it wrong and treating a lot of go the easy route for me as a salesperson instead of what's right for the customer and that's it that they're not understanding you know the, the problem so they're putting someone else's solution to the problem they want the solution to look uh, the way they wanted to look instead of understanding the problem. Mm. Yeah. Hey, this has been a great conversation, Ian. Where do always, people go always. to uh, connect with you and learn about uh, what you're working on? Sure. So I always give the two two key social networks. I'm on lots, but re realistically, the usual is obviously LinkedIn. And they can go find my LinkedIn profile nice and easy with Ian Moise, I A N M O Y S E dot co dot UK, and it will take you straight there. And the same again for Twitter, Ian Moise dot cloud, and that'll find me on my Twitter account. And you can either follow or engage on either as appropriate. Hey, we've got a little bit of realism there. I hope you enjoyed that. I love talking with other salespeople, sales leaders about what's working for them, cut through the BS, and talk about, you know, the real you know, nuts and bolts of what works, what doesn't work, how to balance it all together to crush your number. Now, I want to make sure you're all aware of uh, b2brevenue.com. I got some blog stuff there. I got the free ebook and the training course. And I, if you know somebody who wants to break into B2B sales, but you just don't know how, it might be you, it might be somebody else you know, a family member, somebody who's like stuck in retail or you know, selling B2C and they don't see a future there. They see it, you know, the writing's on the wall. I've got a lot of people who are coming over from car sales, re uh, retail sales, real estate, who want to learn how to get break into working at a company. Why? Because that's where the future is. That's where the money is. That's where all the opportunities are. There's career growth and there's benefits and there's longevity. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. If you're happy where you are, stay there. I'm not trying to talk you in or out of something. I just want to make sure you're aware of what the world is like on the B2B side. So check that out. It's called uh, SDR, Sales Development Rep Grad School, and it takes you through you don't even have to be in sales. I'll walk you through the whole process. You'll have access to it for a year. Doesn't mean it takes a year. It means you have access to it for a year. It could take you a couple of weeks or it could take you a year, right? We all need help. We all need a coach, someone to bounce ideas off of, a little community to see what's working for other people. And that's what I'm trying to build with these courses and office hours. And the office hours are there for us to get on onto Zoom 
do a screen share, uh, cover both a, a lesson, some feedback, some questions, and be able to share experiences about what working and what's not working for us. So please make sure you're checking out that. Also, check out the show notes for all the connections to um, everybody who's a partner with me on this journey with the B2B Brutal Truth uh, podcast network. Hey, we got a network. I also have a podcast called Career Advice. Because what's happened is most of your questions are career-oriented questions. Uh, you know, a lot of you have great sales skills. Some of you feel you're, they're good enough and you just want better career advice. So I've started that podcast. It's not just for salespeople. It's for people, anybody in their careers to talk about, you know, strategy, what I've seen work, mistakes I've made, and I've seen other people make and how to prevent them. So the idea of the podcast is just a fun riff and chat with people on career topics that matter to you. Because let's face it, if you pick the wrong industry, oh, or you, you, don't, you pick the wrong company or the wrong manager or the wrong territory, all of a sudden, it's so easy in sales to get on that downward spiral. And let's face it, it uh, uh, it's stacked against us now with these companies that 53% are making quota. When I got into sales, it was like, if you didn't make quota, you were put on a plan. Today, it's like, I think a lot of it's commission control, honestly. You know, uh, not that there aren't a lot of bad salespeople out there. I think most salespeople are trying. Uh, they're, they're doing what they're told, but what they're told doesn't work anymore. It used to work. It worked three years ago, five years ago, 10, 20 years ago, but it ain't working today. Why? Because in sales, much like in marketing, it's like a weapon defense system, right? You All of a sudden, when you have radar, then you have radar jamming. Then you have anti-radar stealth flyers. And then you have all these things that try and combat each other. And that's what sales and marketing is. It's all about <laughs> finding the little niche that works. And what I'm trying to do is take you back with technology to what won't change in sales, the things about people, the things about the process that people go through, the process that companies go through, that that really isn't going to change. It really isn't. It's going to uh, be affected how you get access to people. You don't have to knock on their door anymore or go visit them sometimes. But what isn't going to change is that it's a human being with a reptilian brain that has a lot of priorities and today is well over distracted. So make sure you're checking out everything at b2brevenue.com uh, and sign up for there. I don't spam. I don't send, I haven't sent out an email yet that isn't a autoresponder to get the book. That's it. And I'll probably, maybe we'll do one a month, maybe not. I, I don't believe in, you know, filling up your email box. I, I like the opt-in you know, if you, you come to the podcast and you listen. And I would download most of the, the episodes because it only keeps the top 300 and we're way past that going into our ninth year here. You know, it's it's been a wild journey. So in August, it'll be nine years. I've been kind of talking into all, like four different mics. I've been upgrading almost every year, every other year. But I have loved doing it. I love connecting up with salespeople and helping you crush your number to get, you know, your dreams, you know, what, what you want out of life. And, and sales gives us that capability, right? Because we have a variable income. Uh, and hopefully that variable is big. <laughs> and that's my job. Let's get that variable bigger. Okay? Let's so not get stuck. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Hey, and tell somebody about the show, will you? Get on LinkedIn, share it. Give me a little thumbs up now and then, would you? Help a brother out.